So at this point, we know that these two relationships are true. And then we also know that our xi of x is going to be equal to this expression over here. But right now, we still have too many unknowns for us to derive any meaningful conclusions out of the setup that we have at the moment. So one thing we're going to notice is that recall that this xi of x is only half of the solution. So the other half involves this time component. So we need to multiply this time component to the xi of x to get our wave function. And then notice that if we multiply this e term over to this e to the pos a power of positive i k x term, what you're going to get is essentially a wave function that is going to go from the left hand side to the right hand side. So this is going to correspond to the region x is larger than zero. So if you multiply this term to this term, the resulting term is going to correspond to a wave that is travels from the left to the right. And then if you multiply this time term over to this term, this e to the power of negative i k x, the resulting term is going to be a wave that's traveling from the right to the left. And the same goes for these two terms. So if you multiply it to this a, so to this term that's multiplied by the a, that's going to be a, a wave that's traveling from the left to the right, and then this will be traveling from the right to the left. And you can see this if you just try to graph out these individual e terms. So you can try to imagine there being a real and an imaginary axis, and then this is going to be your x-axis. And then if you just try to graph this out, you will get something like this. And then you can just try to uh, multiply this uh, time term over here to this term over here. And then you can see that as time uh, goes on, as time increases, this whole waveform, this shape over here, is going to travel over to in this direction, so in, towards the positive x direction, so from left to right. So this is where this comes from. So you can visualize this by imagining this graph over here. So moving on, uh, so right now we have this problem where we have too many unknowns. So one way to simplify this setup over here is that we're going to consider a setup where you can imagine you have your x axis and then your potential is going to be at this very point. It's going to go to negative infinity. And then we're going to imagine we have a wave that is traveling from the left to the right. So we're going to start from the negative direction and then it's going to travel from the left to the right. And then once it, once it reaches this point, two things are going to happen. Either it's going to bounce back or it's going to keep on going. Right? But then in both of these situations, it's uh, in no situation you would assume that there is going to be a wave coming from the right to the left in the positive x direction. So if you start off with a wave that's traveling from the left to the right in the negative direction, you would expect only wait for the wave to bounce back or to keep on going. You, you won't expect the wave to miraculously come from the positive infinity section coming from the right to the left. So what this means is that we can assume that in our case, in our case where we're considering a wave traveling from the left to the right, we can assume that g is going to be equal to zero. So let's try to consider a case where g is equal to zero and see if we can come up with any meaningful conclusions from the setup that we have over here. So we're going to start off with the assumption that g is going to be equal to zero. So once we let g is equal to zero, you can see that immediately this relationship becomes f is equal to a plus b. And then for this relationship, we get f is equal to 1 plus 2 beta i a minus 1 minus 2 beta i b. So you see that by assuming that g is equal to 0, we, have, um, we are already automatically considering the case where the wave is traveling from the left to the right. And then it's going to either bounce back or it's going to pass the the uh, di direct delta potential at x equals equal to zero. So once again, this is a wave traveling over here, and it's either going to bounce back or it's going to keep on going. And this setup here is going to be implied by the assumption that g is equal to zero. So moving on with this, let's try to uh, derive, uh, define everything in terms of a. So let's try to define f and b in terms of a. So the first obvious thing to do is to minus these two, uh, is to subtract these two equations with, with each other. So on the left hand side we have f minus f which is equal to 0 and over here we have uh, 1 plus 2 beta i a minus a so we get 2 beta i a and then here we have minus 1 minus 2 beta i a so if we minus b this becomes 2 minus 2 beta i b and if we dump everything to the right hand side we can see that b is equal to 2 beta i a divided by 2 minus 2 beta i and the 2's just cancel out so you see that b is equal to 
theta i divided by 1 minus theta i a. So this is the rela relationship for b. So always re recall that beta is defined over here in case you've forgotten. So using this, we can also find what f, sh f should be. So we can see that f is equal to a plus b. And just now we've already found what b should be. So b is equal to beta i divided by 1 minus beta i a. So we can combine these terms. We have 1 plus beta i divided by 1 minus beta i a. So this term, I can just we can just do simple addition of fractions. So you can see these two cancel out. So in the end, you get 1 divided by 1 minus beta i a. So this is the expression for f. So just to summarize a bit, we have b being equal to beta i 1 minus beta i a, and then f is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus beta i a. So this is a very important conclusion. So you can see that at this point we still have too many unknowns. We still don't know what a is. So we need to find a in order to find f and b. But it turns out we don't have to find what a should be in order for us to, to derive something meaningful. So we're going to consider the ratio between a and b. So I'm going to define something called the reflection co uh, coefficient. And this is going to be equal to the absolute value of beta squared divided by a, the absolute value of a squared. So recall that the term multiplied by a, this is going to be the wave that is traveling from the right to left. And then b is going to be the amount that is going to bounce back. So this ratio over here, the absolute value of b squared divided by the absolute value of a squared, this is going to be the ratio of the waves that's going to end up bouncing back. So that's why I'm calling this the reflection coefficient. And then using what we have over here, we can calculate what this reflection coefficient should be. So we have beta i 1 minus beta i absolute value square. So this should also be an a over here. And this will be divided by absolute value of a squared. So these, obviously, they cancel out. So in the end, we have the absolute value of beta i squared divided by 1 minus beta i squared. So this just becomes beta squared. And then this becomes 1 plus beta squared. So we call that uh, 1 minus beta i absolute value squared is just equal to 1 minus beta i multiplied by 1 minus beta i conjugate. So if you take the conjugate of 1 minus beta i, that just becomes 1 plus beta i. And if you multiply this together, you get 1 plus beta squared. So that's, that's where this comes from. So this is going to be what the reflection coefficient should be. And now I'm going to uh, define the transmission coefficient. And then you can see that based on, uh, based on a similar kind of reasoning, our transmission coefficient is going to be equal to the absolute value of f squared divided by the absolute value of a squared. So we call that f is the amount of wave that is going to be traveling from the left to the right in the positive x region. So this is going to represent the amount of wave that manages to pass through the direct delta potential. So this is so if we calculate the uh, ratio between f and a, this is going to be the ratio of the amount of waves that's going to be traveling through the barrier. So this is the amount that gets reflected. This is the amount that gets through the barrier. So using what we've calculated, we can once again find the transmission coefficient. So it seems like I left out the a again, so there should be an a over here. So once again, this, these cancel out. And in the denominator, you have something pretty similar to this term over here. So we just get 1 divided by 1 plus beta squared. So this is the transmission coefficient.